As has been previously mentioned, we have a lot missing, but we also have a lot of visitors today. Amen. And that's always good to see. And it's also good to see some other familiar faces. Shirley, it's good to have you back. And Pedro and Emily, glad to have you here. And uh, hopefully, well, we pray that everyone here receives a blessing and I need to turn this on or Jean will have fits back there. Crackle, crackle. Okay, is that better, Jean? All right, almost forgot to do that. Once again, let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, again, as we talked about in Sabbath school, we ask that you would send your spirit to, to be with us. We pray that through it all that you would lead us to see a better image of Christ. We pray that you would be with each person here, that they may hear the message that they need today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Over here on the table, I have some objects. You probably can't see them very well. So I'm going to hold them up. I have a wonderful chunk of broken plastic. Okay? Many of you recognize this as a bicycle helmet. Kind of old and nasty. And over here is a rather tattered Bible. Okay? It's kind of been taken out of use because it might lose all of its pages if it were used. Okay? And over here we have a trophy. Oklahoma Pine Car Derby Staff. Most unique car, 1999. Okay? Now, as we begin, I want you to think, what is the common thread between the items on the table? There is a connection. But I would like to take your mind back to the scripture, or at least which a portion of it was read just a few minutes ago. And I'd like you each to get out your Bibles, okay, because we're going, to, we're going to be using them quite a bit this morning. I want you to go to Genesis 28, and we're going to pick up the story just a little bit ahead of where uh, Jonathan read the scripture. Now, he was reading from the New International Version, which actually makes some of the uh, language sound a little smoother. I'm reading from the King James. So let's pick up and we'll, we'll just kind of skip through this a little bit. A uh, little bit of history. Jacob had deceived his brother Esau out of the birthright. And although this had been bargained and negotiated a while back, Esau was none too happy about it and had sworn that he was going to kill Jacob. So under some other excuses, Jacob is running for his life from the area of Canaan back to the area that we would now call Iraq, I believe, um, back to Abraham's stomping grounds. So Genesis 28, picking up in verse 10. And Jacob went, went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. That's Canaan toward Iraq. Verse 12. And he dreamed and behold a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold the angels of God ascending and descending on it. That's the inspiration for our song, We Are Climbing Jacob's Ladder. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said... I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest. So he hasn't really left Canaan yet. 
The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee shall thy and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with you, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land. Okay? Jumping to verse 16. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid, and said, How dreadful is this place. I like the other version that says how. What is it that said, Jonathan? How awesome? Not yeah, how awesome is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house, and all that thou shalt give me I will get, surely give the tenth to thee. So what was the purpose of the stone? We have all this other stuff going on, but what's the purpose of the stone? And what lessons can we learn from the stone and, of course, these circumstances? Well, the stone was to provide a place that when he came back by, it was a place to remember. An event where he had had a true encounter with God. And I'm going to refer to it as a stone of remembrance. Okay? The rock. A second thing. Okay? It was to, it was to commemorate the place where he had met with God. It would also bring to his memory, to help him remember, God's promise to him that God would be with him and bless him. What else happened there? God made a vow to Jacob. What else happened? Jacob made a vow to God. So this rock is a monument to what happened there, the promise of God, a vow that God would be with, more than just that God would be with him, and his vow to God. And if we look at that, it became... Maybe not his full conversion, but it was a turning point in Jacob's life. Jacob, his direction changed at that point. Now, let's roll the calendar. Jacob, where did he go from there? He went on to Laban, his uncle, I believe it was. And when he is there, he makes a bargain for, as they did back then, I, I don't remember as extreme negotiations when I got joy, but he worked for seven years and then was tricked, another seven years, and there's, there's a whole bunch that goes on there, and the whole time Laban is scheming and cheating him. But 20 years later, he has at least 12 kids. 
they tended not to talk about the girls very much. And I would suspect that there were some of those there as well, but only, is it Diane or Diana gets mentioned? So he has these kids, he has servants, he has cattle. And now God comes back to him. Let's go to Genesis 31. 31 verse 13. God returns to Jacob. And he says, I am the God of Bethel. Where's Bethel? What? That's where he set up the stone. Okay? Very important point. I am the God of Bethel. If you read all the, all the area of that in the first text, it names it was named this and it was named that and it was named but Jacob called it Bethel okay so God says I am the God of Bethel where thou anointest the pillar and where thou vowedest a vow unto me now arise get thee out from this land and return unto the land of thy kindred so now what is the purpose of the stone? What? It's a marker, but now what is the purpose of that stone? God is calling Jacob to remember to return to his roots. Okay? Think about that. Okay? We have to jump on down to Genesis chapter 35. There's some intermeaning things that happen. We'll get back to part of that. Genesis 35, verses 2 through 4. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him. Who's all with him? His servants, his cattle. I don't know how much he talked to his cattle, but anyway. He, he's got this whole body of people and animals then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments, and let us arise and go up to where? Bethel, which earlier Jacob calls the house of God. Okay? And I will make the and and I will make there an altar under God unto God who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all their earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. Okay, so he's on his way, and what is he doing? He's having the household prepare to meet. Apparently Jacob, or at least those in his camp, which he was the, the, the patriarch of the group, but apparently there were those in his camp that had become lax in their spiritual experience. And as Jacob looks back and remembers the pillar, what does he see? In his mind, he remembers that day. He's approaching back to that place. And his mind recounts the time, the, the 20 years that have taken place. And he can see his personal, not only just that of the camp, but he can see his personal meanderings spiritually. He's kind of been wavering in his path. His stone of remembrance has now become a compass giving him direction for the future. You, you understand that? As he looks back, he says, my path has not been very straight and clear. But I look back and I see where I should have been heading. And I'm headed that way now. Okay. 
I can almost picture it as they are nearing, the, nearing Bethel, the place of the stone. Jacob wonders if the rock is still there as he sees the hill in the distance. Then he's not sure if, he, if he's imagining it or if it is real, but he thinks he sees an out-of-place rock on the top of the hill. And he limps as fast as he can up the hill. And then he calls the family around. However many it is, the family, the servants. And in quiet reverence, almost, you you know what breathless excitement is? He exclaims, family, Reuben, Judah, Rachel, Leah, this is the place. This is the place This is the very stone. This is where God met with me. So what has the purpose of this stone become at this point? It has called him back, but it has become a a compass, a, a needle of direction. You know, actually, we find many stones of remembrance in the Bible, and they each have a purpose. Often they are associated with a major event, such as God speaking, or as we'll see later, a big miracle, or or the commemoration of a vow or a promise. Sometimes the stone is not an actual physical stone, but another object used to bring things to remembrance. For instance, the rainbow that Noah saw at the ark, okay? It wasn't a physical stone, but it served the same purpose. It was the rainbow of promise to Noah that whenever he saw the rainbow, he should remember that God had promised that the world would not be destroyed by a flood again. Sandwiched between the vision of the ladder of heaven, or the ladder to heaven, and Jacob's return to Bethel, we find another stone or stones of remembrance. Here we find that it again, well, Jacob is indeed actually leaving the household of Laban and on his way to Bethel. Because of all of Laban's scheming and treachery, Jacob and his whole household have left secretly. When Laban finds out, he is none too pleased and and takes chase with ill intent. So again, Jacob is somewhat running for his life. Fortunately, God intervenes and warns Laban to do Jacob no harm. And they come to an agreement. And I'd like you to go back to Genesis 31. 31, verse 44. And we're going to just, we're going to skip through this. We're just going to pick up some excerpts. Genesis 31, beginning in verse 44. Now therefore, come thou, let us make a covenant. This is Laban speaking, okay? Now therefore, come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou, and let it be a witness between me and thee. And Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. And Jacob said unto his brethren, gather stones And they took stones and made a heap. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between me and thee this day. Therefore, the name of it was called Galid and Mizpah. That's verse 49. I kind of skipped a little bit there. For he said, The Lord watch between me and thee when we are absent one from another. Jumping on to verse 51. And Laban said to Jacob, 
Behold this heap, and behold this pillar, which I have cast betwixt me and thee. This heap be witness, and this pillar be witness, that I will not pass over this heap to thee, and thou shalt not pass over this heap and this pillar unto me for harm. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge betwixt us. So what he's saying, he's saying, don't you ever come see me again? No. What he's saying is, we have made a vow between us. I will, if I'm coming this way and I see that pile of stones, I'm going to remember that I promised I would not cross this line to do you harm. And you promise that if you come this way and you see this pile of rocks and pillar, that you will not do me harm. Okay. So what are the stones doing in this incident? Essentially it's a written peace treaty. A written peace treaty, except they didn't quite write it down, but they knew something else had happened. The stones were a witness. Bunch of dead stones. But they are there as a witness to remind either of them. So the stones are declared to be a witness. And secondly, what are they providing a remembrance for? They are providing a... They're a stone of remembrance to commemorate a vow. We had that previously. But who is the vow between this time? It's between two human beings, two relatives to be exact. And every time they came across this pile of stones, these witnesses, they were to remember the vow that they had made between them. It was a relationship vow. Okay? We each need those. Now, it's been previously mentioned, but you know, 40 years ago, there was a big stone of remembrance. Right? And tomorrow, we're going to help Bob and Therese remember that stone of remembrance that monumental event when they made solemn vows. I don't know that they had, I was there, they didn't have a pile of stones, okay, but they had a lot of other witnesses, okay. They made solemn vows before God and to each other and they will be celebrating God's leading through 40 years. So again, I would invite you to come join us that's what anniversaries are all about. Okay? All right. So now we, we've had these stones. They commemorate when God speaks. They, they're witnesses. They are changes in direction. They can be a compass. They can commemorate vows between God and man, vows between humans. Okay? So now then, I'd like for us to pick up another scene in the Bible. Let's go to Joshua. Joshua 4, verses 1 to 3, and then we'll, pick, we'll jump on down to 19. Joshua. So what's our circumstances here? Most of us know the story. But Israel has been wandering for 40 years in the wilderness. And now they have come to the Jordan River. It says it was in springtime flood. It was outside of its banks. And there's a, there's a whole lot to the story. Lots of lessons there. And they were, the priests went ahead... Two, about two-thirds of a mile ahead of the whole group and walked into the water. When they did, the flood waters 
It says they piled, water doesn't pile up. Water seeks its flat level. The story, the water piled up. It's not supposed to do that. And, but it did, because God directed it to. And they crossed the river on dry ground. Okay. So, we're picking it up. Chapter 4, verses 1 to 1, and we'll, like I say, we'll skip on down. And it came to pass, when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, they must have been standing there a long time for a million plus people to cross in front of them. Uh, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you, ye shall lodge this night. So jump on down to verse 19. And the people came up out of Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal, in the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until ye were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know what? The hand of the Lord that is, that it is mighty that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. So what was the purpose of these stones of remembrance in this instance? Okay. The number one reason to remember a great miracle of remembrance of God's physical salvation it says in the text that all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty. I've never seen anything like that. None of us here have. No, as we will discuss later, we've all seen the workings of God. But I've not seen the water pile up. I've not seen the Red Sea opened. Second purpose of the stone of remembrance is when they see it, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. Now, it would also, as is stated, would provide opportunity for instruction to the children, to future generations. Children are inquisitive. Around our house right now, we hear a fair amount of why. They see something unusual, they will ask why. They'll ask that even if they don't see something unusual. The stones told of their past of slaves and wanderers. The stones pointed to their future as children of the covenant. No, it pointed, reminded them that no barrier was too big for God. In reality, though, these stones of remembrance had even broader scope, okay? I mean, they, what I just said above is stated in the text. But I want you to think about what else those stones could mean. The crossing of the Jordan marked a change in spiritual direction. What had the previous 40 years been characterized by? We're going to do it our own way. We're going to 
They murmured. They complained about everything. Now, maybe if I were in the middle of the hot desert, I might be prone to... We, we are very critical of them. But how are we when we get in some straight circumstances? But it was a change of spiritual direction for the people of Israel when they crossed over Jordan. Previously, their way had been marked by their own doings, their own way. The crossing of the Jordan marked a change of direction to trusting God to fight their battles for them. To trust God for the future. The stones of remembrance also marked the change from being wandering nomads in the desert to becoming homesteaders in the promised land. The change from wanderers to coming home to where they belonged. Unfortunately, there's another lesson here for us. Stones of remembrance must be maintained. Stones of remembrance must be remembered. Eventually, the Israelites failed to continue the remembrance. And as they failed to remember, it was not long before they slid into idolatry. We could go on with other stones of remembrance. For instance, you have Samuel. And the Philistines are coming after them, and there was a mighty miracle of God. And he raised up a stone and called it Ebenezer. Now, while I was contemplating and studying for this sermon today, thinking of stones of remembrance, I thought of some that we probably don't think of as stones of remembrance. But the thought came to me, God himself has set some stones of remembrance. Okay? You're going to have to follow my logic on this one. Go to Psalms 102, verse 25. Psalms 102, verse 25. Okay? 102, verse 25. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. What would the foundations of the earth be made of? Stone. What is the purpose of this stone of remembrance? How do we recognize the earth as a stone of remembrance? We should all be very familiar with it. If you need to look it up, Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So every week, as the Sabbath comes by, it is to be a stone of remembrance for us to remember God's great act of creation because there is no other entity anywhere that can do that. But it's very easy for us to forget unless we consciously 
maintain our stone of remembrance. So, I'd like to again call your attention to our table over here. My worthless piece of plastic. What? It's plastic. But you're right. Some of you may recognize what piece of plastic it is. You will know shortly. Most of you recognize the bicycle helmet. Again, the Bible and a trophy. What is the common thread these all have? Regardless of their material, they are a stone of remembrance for somebody. Okay? I can tell you this. The falling apart Bible is a spiritual stone of remembrance. This was given to Joy, what, your junior year in academy? You were 17. Given to her by her folks. It's got a fair amount of markings in it and is, as others would say, past its prime. Can't really be used anymore. But we hang on to it. We all need, well, let me back up here, and hopefully my computer's still alive up here. Let's talk about this. Why would someone hang on to this? It gets thrown into a drawer. Uh, uh, Edwin, I may need some help here. Are we? It's dinging at me here. If you can get me on the first slide. Try it. We're not moving. Try that one. There we go. A little larger view of it. A relatively quick story. When I was going to engineering school, I worked at the structures lab. Now, quite frankly, for the most part, it was a fun place to work. We had the equipment where we could put together full-size buildings, I mean within limits, and we could test them. We could push them over. It was fun. Our motto was, if you can make it, we can break it. Now... Having said that, Edwin, I may need you just to, there we go. Okay, this isn't the actual picture, but the lab had in it what we call an overhead bridge crane. This is the bridge, and it has rails. In our case, it was an underslung one, but it could move the length of our lab. And it was five ton, we could pick up some pretty heavy stuff and move it around. That's pretty good. One day, well, for quite a while actually, I was working on a test apparatus. And the test apparatus, we were testing some metal building shear panels. But I'll try to show you here. Okay, this is our rough picture, we had this frame. It was probably 15 feet tall. The bottom of the bridge beam that goes back and forth and back and forth was probably right at, it was probably about two inches above. It gave us clearance for it to pass over the top of the apparatus. 
and we had another frame up here horizontally here that we used to stabilize things. So I was working on it on a ladder up here with the top of it just barely touching or just barely catching the top of the frame and I had a frame beam behind me. Now some of you who have worked in an industrial facility there's a distinct sound that you will hear. You will hear the relays snap and a motor hum and you know the crane is moving. And I was on top and the bridge beam was about four feet in front of me. Now we could talk about all sorts of OSHA regulations and what should have been done and what wasn't done about disabling the crane and all those sort of things. But the facts were I was facing that crane beam. I heard the relay snap. I heard the motors hum and I started yelling. And I started scrambling down the ladder, but I'm a little bit restrained here by the beam behind me. Okay? By that time, the beam is moving. I had moved down but the crane, the bridge beam, hit the top of my ladder. Okay, now look at it a second. The beam is moving this way. What's going to happen when it hits the ladder? Two things. If it goes backwards like that, what's behind me? a beam, I'm crushed. Because you don't stop that much mass moving. If this beam hadn't been behind me, what would have happened? It would have thrown the ladder backwards, right? What? Yeah. If the beam had been going the other way, I would have not have had time to get my head down below. But instead, it was just right, the beam contacted the plastic tip of the ladder. It gave way, and I'm here today, okay? So as we look at these things, this is a stone of remembrance. And you say, well, it was a good thing you only put the ladder up so high. When I put that ladder up, I wasn't thinking of that. But the Lord God of heaven, through his angels, knew ahead of time what position my ladder needed to be in and also made sure that the plastic broke. Right here, you can't, you can look at it later. There's a dent in the top of the plastic that you can see where it made impact. Oh, there, okay. There's the, the dent where the impact was. So this is a stone of remembrance. I don't just keep it as an idol on the top of my dresser and say every day I look at it, but it's in a drawer. And periodically when you rummage through the drawer, you come across that and say, ah, yes. The Lord was with me that day. And it gives me confidence that he had a reason that day to intervene. And what am I doing with that opportunity? We all need stones of remembrance. And God has placed stones of remembrance in each of our lives. Stones of remembrance. They may not actually be a physical object. They may be an event. They may be the establishment of relationships. They may be a spiritual awakening or change of direction. We all need them. Stones of remembrance serve the same purposes today that they did in Bible times. They lead us to recognize and teach our children. The hand of the Lord is mighty. 
the hand of the Lord is mighty to save. It has been said Christianity is only one generation from extinction. We must point our children to our stones of remembrance. And of course, teach them the precepts of the scripture as well. We must look back and see God's care and leading, but move forward in trust. There's a quote that many of us are very familiar with. Now she's speaking of the history of the church, but it actually applies to each one of us. In reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say, praise God. As I see what God has wrought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teachings in our past history. We need to remember where God has touched our lives. When, when times are tough, we need to look back to stones of remembrance. We are in grave danger if we forget to remember. Stones of remembrance can serve as a compass in our current life. We can look back and see where we have strayed from the path that was given to us, as Jacob did, and look back, and that look back can steer us back to the path that was set before us. Sometimes we may wonder where God is leading, but we can look back at the stones of remembrance in the past and see, thus far hath God led, and, the, and, trust that, and trust that God will not make mistakes in his leading. You know, when I think about that, and some of you have been pathfinders in the past, some of you have been scouts. There used to be an honor or a badge called track and trail. Amanda, did you ever do track and trail? Dale? Okay. Now with cell phones and GPS and all that sort of stuff, who cares? Just carry your phone and you can get in touch with somebody and they'll, they'll figure out how to get to you, right? But there was a method, it was called track and trail, where to, whether you were in the desert or you were in a wooded area or in a grassy area, you would take and you would leave marks as to where your path had been so that someone else could follow you, but also so that you could follow your way way back, where you took, you would take rocks and you would, if, you, if there weren't trees and brush around, you would take rocks and you would put them in a certain pattern that would indicate, I turned that way. And as we look back on our lives, it's kind of like looking at track and trail. We can look back and we can see these stones of remembrance. And, and I've only told you one today, but I could name trails where I can say, God was with me. I can also tell you times when I kind of moved away from the path a little bit, but God brought me back. Okay? We must not be tempted to question God's leading that he has made mistakes in the past. Now, we make mistakes, that's true. But he has a plan for each one of us. And as we see that leading through our track and trail of stones of remembrance, it will give us confidence for the future. In Desire of Ages, page 224, God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose they were fulfilling as co-workers with him. As we look back at the stones of remembrance that God has given us, we will recognize God's leading, that God has started a work in us. And if we will let him, he will complete it. Uh, turn with me to Philippians 1, verse 6. Philippians 1, verse 6.
Philippians 1, verse 6. It's a memory for many. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We have an assurance that if we will turn our lives over to Christ, he has a plan for us. He has a plan for each of us to be in the kingdom. And if we will allow him, through the Spirit as we were talking in Sabbath school class, if we will allow the Spirit to mold our lives, he will complete the work in us that he planned for us. Now, as we look at this table, Edwin's going to tell us a little bit more about this other piece of junk here. Have you noticed anything different about what's on the table? What's at the far end? It's a trophy. We're all pretty proud of it. Pine car derby. But what does the trophy represent? It's a stone of remembrance. I pick it up, I remember. What is the purpose of that stone of remembrance? Right. That trophy is a different stone of remembrance. In some ways, it's an imposter, okay? Because the purpose of that trophy is to commemorate my accomplishments. Hey, guys, you want to see? We made, we did it. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't have any trophies. But when we dwell on them, they can lead us in a different direction from God's leading. I start dwelling on my accomplishments. It turns the attention to me rather than what God is willing to do through me if I turn my life over to him. And for a a study on that, which we don't have, have time for today, I would remind you to go to Daniel 3 and Daniel 4 to see where the monument in the plain of Dura, the statue, who was it? Who was it commemorating? Is this not great Babylon that I have built? Whole another study, but I would remind you of the implications of that story. Okay. Now, if we go back to a previous example, when we have Laban and Jacob there at Mizpah. What was it that Laban said about the stones, the pile of stones? This heap be witness and this pillar be witness. Okay? The stones were to be Witnesses. They're kind of like silent witnesses, aren't they? And this, this hit me yesterday as well. I'd like you to turn to 1 Peter 2, verse 5. We're going to do a little bit of inferred math here. 1 Peter 2, verse 5. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So what are we? We are living stones. Now, you're going to have to follow me through on the math here. You know, I have that thing where if A equals B, B equals C, then A equals C. We are living stones, right? What are the stones? The stones are witnesses. Therefore, we are to be living witnesses. And we're going we're to hammer that this whole quarter with the book of Acts. 
we are to be living witnesses. We can be and should be living stones of remembrance to those around us as we witness to God's leading and care in our own lives. In fact, as Jesus came down the mountain toward Jerusalem on uh, triumphal entry, Jesus implies that if we, as witnesses, keep quiet, the stones themselves will cry out. Let's not make the stones do the crying, okay? Let us be witnesses. So let's bring it home to our day. We all have stones of remembrance. And I've asked a few people, we don't have a whole lot of time this morning, to give us some short explanations to tell us some of their stones of remembrance. So, Edwin, if, if you want here, I, if you want the mic back there, you want to just use this one. Okay, turn it kind of to the side there. First of all, always wear one of these. Um, this helmet I've been, I used for many years. Um, at one point, a church member um, loaned a go-kart to me so I could play with it out in the yard. And as you can see, that's kind of what a grasshopper looks like, driving some piece of machinery. Um, I did not get on and off of the thing very easy because it was built for somebody much smaller. Now I had been uh, working on it, tinkering on it. I learned how to do a lot of different mechanic uh, things with it. I'd just gotten a new motor that was given to me because someone else couldn't make it work and I was playing with it. I was having trouble getting it tuned and driving it down the driveway, mess with it, drive it, mess with it. And um, at the end of our um, driveway, um, there was a fence. And as I was driving this, and I could explain it later all if you want, a combination of the throttle stuck wide open and the steering stuck. I couldn't turn. This is not a good combination. Now remember the grasshopper effect. I couldn't get off of it. I hit a chain link fence, I figure it was probably about 25 miles an hour, kind of like going through a cheese grater. Um, I broke my arm, I had stitches, I had places that couldn't be stitched because the skin was just gone. Um, now if you look, it was, sorry, can I use this one? If you look, it was a, a fence that had been, had been designed for barbed wire, and it was a wooden uh, fence post, and it had a diagonal wire to keep it square to the world. Well, after the fact, after I got home, I looked at the, the ruts in the yard, and I hit approximately there where that um, wire would have gone right across my neck at 25 miles an hour. I don't know how, and this is where the Lord was involved, I did not go through the fence on the go-kart. I went through the fence beside the go-kart where it's much taller. This helmet is cracked. Um, if you want to go ahead and switch there. I don't know if you can, well, it doesn't show up real well. It's got a crack that runs diagonally across the helmet. And then just below that crack, there is a gouge in, in the hard, hard plastic where that, um, if you can go back one, where there's that piece of metal the, that was used to twist and tighten up that diagonal wire it was a, a piece of uh, galvanized pipe that pipe gouged into the helmet 
And uh, that would have been into my head had I not been wearing the helmet. I'm, so this, this is a monument to me of how the Lord intervened and how the Lord worked through my parents to train me to always wear my helmet. I mean, I was just you know, going around the yard, tinkering with it. I wasn't racing or anything like that, but I always wore my helmet. So I'm praising the Lord for training to do the right thing and for the Lord's intervention. This helmet is loaded with all kinds of dings and gouges from that incident. Some of those things you don't realize how serious they are until like a couple days later my brother and I went and looked at it and said, oh my, how did he survive it? Terea, Bob has a mic for you back there. Well, my stone of remembrance is the profession that I'm in today. And many years ago, uh, the Lord did reveal to me uh, his calling for my life and, uh, to be a nurse. And uh, it was verified to me by a complete stranger, just out of nowhere. And came up to me and told me, you're, you're going to be a nurse and you have to go to university. So I went back to the place where I was, my little prayer closet, and I thanked the Lord for, for calling me into the profession. But I pleaded and agonized about this because I had no money, no job. I was a forsaken wife and had two small children, and completely it seemed all impossible. And for about six weeks, I, I was in my prayers every day, asking the Lord over and over and over how university was going to happen in my life and where it was going to be. At that time, I was living in the mountains of Murphy, North Carolina. One day I was just going about my business and we were going to bed and I had had a dream and in this dream I was sitting in a chair in a room with a cloud of smoke or vapor or steam or something just enveloping me in the whole room and it was, I would have stayed there forever and never woke up because it was so peaceful in that dream. And all of a sudden this hand stuck out at me with a present, all wrapped up um, with a bowl, like a birthday present. And I was very excited, and I knew the Lord was handing me this present. And I couldn't believe it was for me. And I heard his voice say, but you can't open it until the appointed time. And, and I woke up instantly, and I, I felt like I was still floating on a cloud. And, and by faith, I took that dream and said, OK, Lord, I'm going to step out of faith, and I'm going to trust you for everything that it's going to take to get me to university. And by that fall, I'm supposed to start by that fall, and this happened in the summer. By that fall, not only did I have the funds to get to university, which was over 1,200 miles away, as a matter of fact, it was at ORU. And um, I was enrolled starting, and I got a full scholarship for four years. Amen. And uh, my rock of remembrance actually is my profession, and I've been continuing it until this day. Okay. It speaks of God's leading in our everyday lives. Uh, LaRue, uh, Bob has a mic. For, oh, you can come up. When Bryant said his email three to six minutes, I said, Bryant, you got to be kidding. I hardly have time to breathe during that time. But I'll condense my story uh, as quick as I can because it could take a full hour. But it begins with one Sabbath morning, and there's a lesson for all of you in this story. 
uh, to apply to your own lives. It was Sabbath morning. I'd been faithfully going to church. And for some reason, I can't remember right now but uh, what the reasons were, but I'm sure there were other reasons behind it. I decided I was not going to go to church that Sabbath. Fatal mistake. And I know many of you have been tempted in your life to say, I'm just going to stay home today. Fifteen years later, I've never stepped inside a Seventh-day Adventist church again. Nobody called. Nobody visited. Nobody wrote. Apparently, nobody wondered where I was at. I just kind of disappeared. But my name was still on the books. But during this time, I met an old friend of mine that I knew from a long time ago. He was a very dear friend of mine. He always knew where I was. He was always willing to help. He was just a wonderful, wonderful friend. Whenever I needed him, he was always there. His name was Mr. Smirnoff. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever met Mr. Smirnoff. But Mr. Smirnoff was 80-proof alcohol better known as vodka. And so we had a good relationship, very good relationship. But one day, it's amazing how God works. I was at work and suddenly I got sick to the stomach and I went outside and I threw up out in the parking lot, but continued working but wasn't feeling all that well and so eventually I went home, stayed in bed for a couple, three days, and finally I did something that I don't like to do. I went to see a doctor. And my doctor wasn't there, but an intern was there. And he said, well, he ran a few things and checked my heart and whatever. And he said, I think you might have bronchitis. Maybe you might be getting pneumonia. I don't know. He said, here, take these pills. If you're not better in 30 days, come back and see me. <laughs> Three days later, I was back there again, and my regular doctor was there, and he says, you want me to call an ambulance, or do you want to have your wife drive you to the hospital? I was only a mile away. I entered into the emergency room, and that was the last thing I remembered for quite some time. I had surgery. I determined I had a busted appendix, and a very, very serious case of a busted appendix. But they operated on me, and my wife went home, and four hours later they called her back and said, you need to come back here as quick as you can, because we're going to have to have a second surgery. What they didn't tell her at the time was they didn't expect me to live, that I was dying. But somehow, by the grace of God, I survived. The doctor came in that morning and told my wife, he says, I come here to see the man I didn't expect to be here. He says, this was the worst case of infection I've ever seen in my life. He says, there's no way that this, your husband, could have survived through the night. It's totally impossible. Well, I was in ICU for four weeks, and then I was in the hospital for an additional two weeks, but through the grace of God, I recovered. Went back to work at a laundromat in Claremore and uh, did dry cleaning there. And I noticed on the records that every week somebody would come in and have his suit cleaned. Well, one day I was there when he came in. And I just struck up a conversation, asked him, you know, what he did and whatever. And he says, well, I'm a pastor. And you know, Ellen White says that God gave us the name Seventh-day Adventist for a reason. It's a name that is packed with power to reach men's heart. And so I said to him, well, what church do you pastor? And he said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I was struck like a bolt of lightning. For the first time in 15 years, I heard the name Seventh-day Adventist. And I went out. In the parking lot, I said, I need to talk to you. And I broke down crying. God was speaking to me. And that started my road back to God. I started going to church again. But I found out that going to church doesn't save anybody. 
You have to find Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And so as time went by, I come in contact with a group of people who eventually come to Owasso <laughs> and started the Three Angels Church. And this is the place where God has brought me. There's an old saying, I'm not like I used to be, but I'm not like I'm going to be either. And I look forward to the second coming of Christ and his soon return. We have, in my mind, to close, we have two things we need to be on guard in our own lives. Number one is we are waiting for Jesus to come. That is a dangerous, dangerous thought. That is a thought of procrastination because while we are waiting for Jesus to come, Jesus is waiting for us. He's looking for a group of people that will represent his character so that he can come and take us home. The other one is, and we're getting into this in Acts, we had a tremendous Sabbath school today. Thank you, Brother Plank. And that is, we are waiting for the Holy Spirit to come into our lives. No. God is waiting for us to surrender our lives so fully and so completely that His Holy Spirit can come into our lives. Because the Holy Spirit will not come into an unclean vessel. And so we as a church, we as a people, we need to surrender our lives fully and completely to Him so that the Holy Spirit will come into our lives, we can finish the work, and we can be, go home to be with Jesus. God has used a tremendous thing happening to me to bring me back to Him. It reminds me that great is His faithfulness, and no matter where we are, God never forgets us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And... Gene, I know most of us know a little bit, but could you quickly explain a stone of remembrance you have? Well, I didn't, I didn't keep my uh, stone of remembrance, but I do have a mark on my face that will remind me. When I was asked to cut open a 55-gallon drum, well, I, I used the torch, and it just blew apart, and it hit me as it was going up in the air. But I know God had kept the blow back from hitting me too hard and taking my head off. And I appreciate everything that he has done for me. Thank you. Yeah, Gene, we were all in this church. It gave a stone of remembrance for our whole church to say it's only by a miracle of God that Gene is with us today. And you know, there are day in and day out, we don't see behind the scenes. There are probably every day close, in close circumstances for each one of us where the angels step in and we never know it. And we can be thankful to him. I ask each of you today, what is your stone of remembrance? Is your stone of remembrance reminding you of God's power in your life? Maybe miraculously, miraculously like you've heard several times today, res rescuing you from death or injury, saving you from your en enemies, perhaps some you didn't even know about, reminding you of where God woke you up, and turned you around like LaRue. Is your stone of remembrance calling you to return to your spiritual roots? As you look back, is your stone of remembrance a compass showing you where you have been and maybe are wandering from the path? And is it pointing you toward your home? Have you forgotten your stones of remembrance? Have you let your maintenance slide? 
so that it is easier and easier to forget. Have you forgotten and abandoned the rock of your salvation? As we look back at our stones of remembrance and see the Lord's leading and care, let us recount our blessings. Sometimes maybe at the time we didn't see it as a blessing. But let us recount our blessings and be inspired to press forward in faith. Join with me as we sing our closing song. It's not in your hymnal. It will be on the screen. Let's count your blessings.